Liam Neeson is one of my favorite actors. I, I uh, appreciate his craft and his ability as an actor. He was in a movie that was really rather hard to watch by the name of Taken. Some of you perhaps saw it and they actually made a sequel to it later. But there's a line in that movie, Taken, that is uh, almost uh, illustrative of one of the realities of modern so-called culture. It so happens that the perpetrator of the crime of the kidnapping of the daughter of the, key, of the character Liam Neeson plays uh, has been caught up to. He is engaged in white slavery. It is a horrific trade. Uh, he has been responsible for the death of many and the selling into slavery of many young ladies. And when Neeson catches up to this villain, the villain lying there about to die, already being shot, looks up at Neeson and says, it wasn't personal. It wasn't personal. It's amazing how often you hear that today. It, it, it's just business. It's not personal that I drove you out of business, that I crushed you under my heel. It's not personal. And indeed, there are so many people today who feel like they've been marginalized and pressed down and ignored and, and, and not treated as a person. One of the worst things that you can do to another human being is to regard them as an object and not to regard them in a personal way. Do you know that is at the core of the teaching, Thou shalt not commit adultery? At the core of that teaching is that you are not to relate to people as mere objects. To be interchanged and discarded and taken up as you please solely for self-gratification. So, what are we to make of the issue of more and more people today, especially in Western culture, challenging the idea that God is a personal God? Our key question today is, can I know God and His love personally? Now, for folks like me, that's an obvious answer. And perhaps that's true for most of you, if not all of you. But this question needs to be answered today, and the Christian faith offers a resounding yes. I think it's important for us to understand why people sometimes are skeptical. For instance, a very popular notion out there today is that our faith is just a crutch. That we cannot bear to uh, reduce ourselves to some kind of a higher form of animal. So as a crutch, we have a need to believe in a God who sees us as more than what we are. And there are other reasons that are put forward for that crutch. That God is the big answer to all the hard questions that we aren't able to answer. Some say that this idea of a personal God is just a childish fantasy. Uh, it's something that we started when we were kids. Maybe we were encouraged uh, to have that fantasy when we were kids and we just sort of held on to it. Uh, we never really grew up and moved on from that. Others say, well, it's just impossible. How in the world could God possibly know everybody in the world? How in the world could God possibly know many ha how many hairs are on my head? Now, for some of you, that wouldn't be too hard. But uh, how could He know that? How could he, how could He care about me that intimately and that directly? And, and how on earth could God hear billions of prayers offered up to Him at the same time, perhaps, or over the period of days. And, and how in the world could we ever expect that a God would care about details in our lives? It's impossible, some would say. And others would say, well, it's just, it's just not needed. It's just not necessary. I mean, uh, we found scientific explanations that satisfy our curiosities, and, and uh, it's just not needed. We, we, we needed God when we had lots of questions, but now that we have so many answers, we don't need God anymore. And and after all, we don't even need God to behave morally. You can be moral and ethical, they say, without a God. In fact, uh, there's a fellow named Shelley Kagan who debated William Lane Craig on that very subject. Is God necessary for morality? Some would say, well, it's just arrogant. It is arrogant for us to suggest 
First of all, that we know God personally. It is regarded as very arrogant for you to say, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I am following Jesus Christ. Some would say, well, that's, that's very arrogant of you to suggest that you can have a relationship with God or with His Son whom you've never personally met. It, it would be like you saying, I, I know some famous person personally, which you only know their reputation. You've really never met them at all. And so they see it as arrogant for us to suggest that we could know God in a personal way. Well, I think the first thing that we need to deal with is this issue. And they would say, if there is a God, if I allow there is a God, then why would He be personal? Why couldn't He be a God like many have talked about who is behind all of the order and design of the world, but after all, He set it in motion and He's really not interested in the individual lives of people. Why not that, they say? It may surprise you to discover, if you have not done so already, that there is a direct connection between a personal God and the existence of a moral universe. I want to share a couple of verses with you from Jeremiah 9. Verses 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts... Remember what I said about arrogance? Here's our basis for that arrogance right here. Let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight. You notice the direct connection between a person saying that they know God and the existence of kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. Those two things are not accidentally linked. They are powerfully and clearly linked. I mentioned a moment ago a man named Shelley Kagan who debated William Lane Craig of the Talbot School of Theology in California on that very issue is or can there be morality without the existence of God. You may or may not know that many former atheists or agnostics became believers in God and ultimately in Jesus Christ because they couldn't get out of their mind the real existence of good and evil. And they recognized that if we truly live in a materialistic universe where people are mere accidents, then where does good come from? And why do I have the concept of evil in my mind? Such was the issue that turned C.S. Lewis into a strong Christian believer. So that issue of, is morality possible without God, is an important question. And it is very much related to the fact that God is a personal God. You see, an impersonal God might have set the world in motion and let it run just like a clock on its own. But an impersonal God would not care about kindness, justice, and righteousness. He would not concern himself with what the things that he made did. Now, there are many other arguments we could make for that, but but that, that, that the existence of those things... You know what's interesting is there are people who will actually say, I've heard them say it, well, good and evil, that's just, that's just an illusion. That's just some concept. But you let somebody steal their car or harm one of their children, and suddenly evil makes a lot of sense. Why is it that we know that some things ought to be and other things ought not to be? Jeremiah the prophet has the answer for that. He says, let, the wise, let, let a man boast that he understands and knows me and connects it to the existence of an awareness of kindness, righteousness, and justice in the earth. William Lane Craig made these statements. He said, without a morality rooted in the existence of God, humans are of no value any more than crickets. Or let's get a little bit more nasty than that, roaches. Now, I know there are a lot of you that love animals as much or more than you love people. Not necessarily in the room, but in the world. 
But I got to tell you, I haven't seen the lady that loves roaches yet. But if there is no God, then we have no reason to think that we are more important than the least creature on the planet. There is no basis for that. No rational basis for that. Without a God who has instilled in us an awareness of morality, of right and wrong, of good and evil. Second, what is the basis of good or evil? Where does it come from? Good and evil are not material, nor are they natural in the sense that naturalists describe them. And yet, people can generally agree on good and evil. There might be some nuances of difference, but by and large, good and evil is understood among the most primitive societies. Where does that come from? Some of those who say that morality uh, is, uh, that God need not exist for morality to exist, have argued that men have talked about good and evil, right and wrong, uh, for many, many years, long before uh, we were aware of the Bible or of Christian faith. Well, that's true, but the question, that doesn't answer the question. The question is, why did they have that awareness? They didn't know God, but why did they know that good exists and evil exists? And that's what William Lane Craig suggests with that question. And then finally, how does morality exist? How does it exist? What, what is it that causes us to have certain codes? For instance, right now we're dealing with the issue of, uh, of poisonous gas in Syria. What is it that causes people to see certain boundaries Certain things that ought not to be. Now, you could decry war, and, and indeed war is a terrible thing. But why is it that even warmongers can be pressed to consider that there is a need for boundaries? Why is that? I mean, if winning is what matters, if prevailing is what matters, then why should there be any boundaries? And from time to time in history, we've seen someone who acted on their atheism with power and became vicious. Horrific. And yet the boundaries keep asserting themselves. The Bible presents to us a growing awareness of a personal God. Can I show you that? Now, I didn't note this in your bulletin for you, but Genesis 4.26, a very interesting verse. It tells us that Seth had a son named Enosh. And man, we are back there a ways. When we talk about Seth. He had a son named Enosh. E-N-O-S-H. And in those days. In that time of that particular generation. Mankind began to call upon the name of the Lord. You know what that means? They began to pray. Now you say well. Didn't the first people know God? Well, yes, there, there, was a, there was a breach in the fellowship between mankind and God caused by sin. Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 59 too. He says that your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hidden His face from you. And, and so there is a breach. But apparently there was a time, an intervening time, when they began to move toward prayer. And Genesis 4.26 tells us, about that. Paul Johnson wrote a book called The Quest for God. If you don't know who Paul Johnson is, he's one of the most prolific authors in England. He's a great historian, literary genius. Uh, he's written way more than 40 books. He, uh, he wrote a biography of Winston Churchill that is considered a classic. But Paul Johnson was talking about a quest for God. He's an ardent believer in Jesus Christ. And one of his chapters is very interesting. Listen to this title. Talking to the God we do not know and cannot prove exists. <laughs> He's talking about prayer. And he's saying that that particular exercise of prayer has been the key to the discovery that God is real and personal. I have met so many people in my life who finally got up the courage to say this. God, if you're real, I really want to know it. And they meant it. And God revealed Himself. It's real easy to be philosophical and, and, and totally focused on your ideas and your mind and, and to boast in your wisdom as we read from Jeremiah the prophet. But there's something about prayer. 
there's something about talking to the God that we perhaps at the first point of talking to Him we do not know. And, and the God that we cannot really prove scientifically exists. And yet somehow we just reach out and speak to Him. Have you done that? I mean really done that. I don't mean in your childhood. I mean recently. Really. Talking again about that growing awareness, you see it from Jeremiah to Jesus to John, three J's. I thought that would be easy to remember. I want to invite you again to another text from Jeremiah the prophet. He is so helpful to us to see how that in the Word of God there is a growing awareness of how personal, just how personal God really is. This is from Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. Now listen, there it is again. That sense of righteousness, justice, kindness. I will put that my law in their minds. He's speaking specifically of His people. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor, a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their nakedness and will remember their sins no more. He's describing people who are in a personal relationship with God. You say, well, didn't that exist before that? He said it's something new. What, what before that? Well... If you really study in the Old Testament, there was a great deal of emphasis on the covenant community and that together they were reaching for God and they had guidance and help and sacrifices. And here and there, there's a flash of a personal interaction between man and God. But Jeremiah is saying that's going to become the way it is. That people can have a personal, real, and vital relationship with God and it's coming in the future. And they will all, all of my people will know me from the least of them to the greatest. It won't just be the wise and learned. It will be all of the people. They will know me. And they will have that relationship with me. Then Jesus steps onto the pages of history. And of course the son of the living God. But let's look if we will at the gospel of John. If you'll find it. The gospel of John 14. And let's pick up at verse 6 very quickly. Jesus answered... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And many people stop at verse 6. It's just a nice, tidy text about not letting your heart be troubled. But we really should read on. If you really knew me, Jesus said, you would know my Father as well. Can I know God and His love personally? Yes, because Jesus has made God more personal than He could have ever been before. And Jesus is saying that that if you know me, then you know my Father as well. There is no difference between knowing me and knowing the Father. That's, That's the message. That's what is implicit in what Jesus is saying here. Now, I want you to notice, he says, from now on you do know him and have seen him. But Philip, thank goodness for the honesty of the Word of God. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. There's one in every group, isn't there? And sometimes I'm him. Philip said that, and then Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. How's that for personal? So Jesus is telling us that not only can we know God and His love personally, we have seen God and His love personally expressed in Jesus. And you say, well, I didn't see Jesus. Listen, through the Scripture, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can know Jesus better than you know your best friend. And if you don't believe that, it's just because you haven't gotten there yet. But it's available. I was reading the blog of an atheist recently. Former atheist, I should say. She was talking about how she struggled, uh, you know, to try to reconcile her 
confidence that there was no God with the calmness that she kept seeing in a believer friend. And she made a startling statement toward the end of her story. She said, now the most intimate relationship in my life is my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And when I read that, I said, hallelujah, that is true of me too. No one knows me like the Lord. And He loves me anyway. I just find that amazing. That's astounding. He knows me. And I am growing in my knowledge of Him better and more and more. I'm learning things about the Lord that I didn't even know when I started out in in, in serving as a pastor. It's amazing. He just keeps revealing Himself. It is the ultimate relationship. Can I know God and His love personally? Absolutely yes. And more than you might imagine. A relative of mine, very dear, close relative, said to me in an honest moment one time, How do you know what you say you know about the Lord? And I looked at her and I said, Jesus Christ is more real to me than you are as much as we've shared. And her response has haunted me through the years. She said, I just can't feel that at all. I want to tell you, friend, that that is the core problem of lostness. Lostness is, at its core, neither knowing nor being known of the Lord. That's what it is. Salvation is not being able to answer the biblical questions right. Salvation is knowing the Lord and being known of the Lord. Well, then you have John the Apostle. And and you say, well, we were reading from John when we read what Jesus said. Yes, but let's hear what John had to say, okay? In another place where he's just telling you his experience. 1 John 1. It's not noted in your notes, but I want you to find it. Listen to his testimony in this growing awareness. Remember what we've said, that Jeremiah talked about a day when we would all know the Lord from the least to the greatest. And then Jesus tells us that through Him we can know the Father in a real and personal way. And we can know what God is really like. And we can know God's love and grace. And Jesus demonstrates the heart of God when He dies on the cross for our sins. But now listen to John as he tells you about the riches of this personal relationship. That which was from the beginning. He's talking about Jesus which we've heard and which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. He's still talking about Jesus. The life appeared. He's talking about Jesus. We've seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we write this to make our joy complete. Oh, my goodness. I mean, what you're looking at in those verses is a man turning into a human Roman candle. He's bursting open with a vivid experience that is too wonderful to keep to himself. That is real and personal and life-changing. And he wants every reader, every listener to experience what he's experienced. And if they do. They will have fellowship with God the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And might I add, with the help of the Holy Spirit, who is Himself the Helper. So there it is. A growing awareness. And finally, an audience of one. An audience of one. Let me just simply ask you a question. Before whom are you living your life? Who are you performing for? Are you performing for some significant person in your life whose opinion matters to you greatly? I'm not saying that's not worthwhile or valid. I'm just saying, is that that the sum total of why you live the way you do? 
Do you know what is true of people who really do have a personal relationship with the Lord? They are living their life for the Lord. They are performing for an audience of one. Isn't it interesting that we have just gone through as a nation a a heart-searching discussion about the National Security Agency created to protect us in the event of terrorist attacks and we've discovered that the National Security Agency has far more access to our communication and personal activities and lives than we realized before. And there's been a lot of foment about that and a lot of discussion about that and a lot of consternation about that. But what the NSA has on you is nothing to compare with what God has on you. I mean, there's just not any comparison. Why in the world would you worry about the NSA? And so I simply want to ask you a question. What are you going to do about that? Some will deny it. Well, that's just not possible. Some will despise it. It aggravates them and they do not want to think about or even contemplate God having that much knowledge of them. But do you know what a believer should do? Embrace it and enjoy it. That's what a Christian ought to do. Embrace God's knowledge of us. You heard me say a few moments ago, He knows me better than anybody and loves me more than anybody too. How about that? That's amazing. That's grace. That's God's grace. And so you embrace God's knowledge of you. You acknowledge, you see what He sees. You confess what He's already said should not be as it is. And and you know what the word confess means? It means to speak with. To say what God says. To agree with God. To say, you're right, God, I'm wrong. And Jesus, what you did on the cross, I needed. I understand why it had to be. Embrace it. And enjoy it. Why is it that Christians sing so much? You ever really thought about it? Why do we sing so much? Because we enjoy. We enjoy God. What is the prime purpose of man? You ever heard that? To know God and to enjoy Him forever. Can I know God and His love personally? Absolutely. That's not the right question. The right question is, do you? And if you don't, will you? Stand with me. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that that the things that I've seen and shared from your word today and the things that I've said would be more than words today, that your spirit would take them and bring them to exciting life. God, we could really understand Paul's exaltation when he said, the light of the glory, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That we could know that. That we could know you, Lord. And I pray today that if there's one here that knows about you, but does not yet know you, that today would be the day that they would enter into a real relationship with you through your son, Jesus. And I pray for those, Father, that have stood at a distance, that they would draw near to you, Lord, to your people, to your mission, and feel the warmth of your embrace. For I pray in the name of your son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We're going to sing together. We would give you an opportunity to come and by your coming say, I need to be a part of this family. I need to know the Lord in a personal way. That may be your need today.
Maybe you've been all around the edges of faith and you've been contemplating it, but it's time today to take a step. Come today as we sing.